you know, look, uh, you know, construction on a runway sometimes brings planes flying right over the venue. Uh, a freakishly huge heat wave in the middle of Poland in May. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can't plan for. All that said, uh, I'm having a hell of a good time here, and I really appreciate you guys uh, putting in that effort to make it work. So uh, again, my name is Rod Spector. I work at Twilio, and I'm going to be talking about uh, rapid prototyping with Django. But first, a history lesson. So you may not know this, uh, but in the American Civil War, there were actually naval battles. Uh, not a lot of folks outside the United States know that uh, there were naval battles in the American Civil War. Arguably, not a lot of people inside the United States know that there were naval battles in the American Civil War. But there were. There totally were. Uh, and they had boats, and they were for real. And probably the most important one is uh, the uh, trendily named, uh, in the 21st century, Battle of Mobile Bay. Uh, and in the Battle of Mobile Bay, you had uh, Rear Admiral David Farragut leading a, uh, a fleet of uh, federal uh, uh, ironclads and wooden ships uh, into three forts and about half a dozen uh, Confederate ships. Uh, and the plan was pretty simple going in. So uh, they had sketched out uh, the uh, Mobile Bay, and there are kind of two elements here that are super important. One is the gigantic fort on the left that has very large guns, and on the right, the gigantic minefield, which they called torpedoes, they're sea mines, uh, that were blocking the entrance to the bay on the right. So uh, David Farragut uh, was uh, tasked with uh, taking uh, the bay uh, for the Union, uh, and in order to do so, he took his fleet, paired them up side by side, and uh, sent them uh, into uh, the breach in between uh, the torpedoes on the right and the uh, fort uh, on the left. And it didn't go so well. <laughs> About five minutes into the battle, uh, the uh, commander of the Tumunska, which is uh, a Tecumseh, which is a, uh, a Union ironclad, uh, just forgets what he's doing for a second and drives straight into the minefield, like five minutes into this thing. So if you're David Farragut, you are not super happy. And also, if you're David Farragut, you're actually also super crazy. Uh, he was a bit of a micromanager, so much so that um, he uh, would crawl to the top of the rigging uh, during a battle in order to see everything that was going on and shout orders uh, to his captains. Uh, this is super dangerous, so dangerous, in fact, his soldiers actually had to lash him to the rigging in order to make sure that he wasn't going to fall uh, to his doom and uh, end, uh, end the engagement uh, before it even began. And as the story goes, when faced with, uh, in this top of his rigging, watching everything go into hell in a handbasket below him, he sent a command to his uh, captain of the ship uh, saying to uh, drive straight through the minefield, drive straight through the torpedoes, go right through the explosive devices uh, that had already cost them a ship. Uh, and the captain was like, what? <laughs> uh, what do you mean go straight through the torpedoes? There are torpedoes here, sir. And he said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And it worked. It actually worked. See, uh, David Farragut knew that those uh, sea mines had been underwater for a very, very long time. And so it was probably just luck uh, that it actually caught a ship and caused it to sink. If he put the entire uh, fleet through uh, the minefield uh, and towards, uh, away from the fort and uh, towards the enemy vessels, uh, his uh, numerically superior uh, fleet would have a better shot uh, at victory. Uh, and it totally worked. Uh, they ended up taking uh, uh, the Battle of Mobile Bay. Uh, it was the most consequential naval battle uh, in the American Civil War. Uh, many people attribute it to uh, the re-election of Abraham Lincoln and the uh, eventual wind down of the American Civil War. So naturally the question is, what the hell does this have to do with Django? Well, the lesson that we can learn from David Farragut is that sometimes when faced with a daunting task, the best thing to do is just grit your teeth take it in the mouth, and plow through at full speed ahead, which is what I feel prototyping is when it's done right. So my name is Rob Spector. Uh, I'm the director of uh, developer evangelism for an outfit called Twilio. Uh, we're a cloud communications firm uh, that makes it really easy for developers to send and receive text messages, uh, make or receive phone calls. Uh, Zach, uh, thank you very much for the plug in the previous talk. I can't believe we lined up <laughs> uh, with each other uh, that well. Uh, quick straw poll, how many of you guys have heard of Twilio before, just for my edification? Oh, what? 
Okay, how many of you who just raised your hands are in Europe, or based in Europe? Wow, Lee Biscuits. Well, that's great news. That's this time last year. That was not the case, my friends. Um, but uh, uh, working at Twilio and in the developer evangelism role, I have the uh, distinct privilege of participating in a large number of hackathons. And to the folks who are kind of uninitiated in the crowd, uh, a hackathon is uh, the ultimate rapid prototyping exercise. Uh, you take a whole bunch of programmers together, put them in a big room, uh, feed them with junk food and caffeine, and see what comes out uh, after they throw themselves through a brick wall and uh, go without any sleep. Uh, I go to a lot of hackathons. I uh, went to about 70 last year. Uh, it's probably going to be around 30 or 40 for me this year. Uh, and in that time, uh, I've learned a lot about some of the tools that I use. And I've learned a lot about Django specifically, which is my go-to framework uh, whenever I'm working uh, in a rapid prototyping scenario. Now, the thing about the 24-hour prototype uh, is that uh, it's something that you should do outside of hackathons as well. You know, uh, Zed talked about it yesterday, and it's something that I absolutely agree with. We don't do enough prototyping uh, as programmers. Often to understand the critical issues of uh, user experience uh, and, uh, uh, and some of the technical problems as well, the best thing to do is just, you know, if you're trying to make a website uh, that is an e-commerce platform for uh, bicycle enthusiasts, Sometimes you have to make something that's a little ugly in order to find your way to something that works. I clicked on the wrong thing. So uh, this is where you need to kind of make a distinction between uh, a production and prototype. You know, uh, when you are usually building code in your day-to-day -day life, you are trying to build something that will endure. You're trying to build something for production. If you're trying to build, uh, you know, a water cooling rig that you intend to sell on Newegg or at Fry's, uh, you try to make it look uh, clean as possible. However, in order to understand some of the thermodynamic problems that you're going to encounter, it may behoove you to try a prototype first. Try something that is super hokey, uh, but kind of gets the job done, so you can understand what the behavior is uh, of coolant uh, on this particular software, right? Uh, it's throwaway code, uh, and that's something that we as developers kind of have a tough time doing, because we don't spend a lot of time doing that, right? When we think about all the things that we have to do in order to make sure our software is stable, from the uh, agile methodologies that we employ uh, to uh, actually implement the code to uh, the test suites that we deploy against it to make sure it's work, most of the time when we're writing code, we don't throw it away, right? And it's something that uh, I feel, if you take a look at for a second, you might be able to uh, ultimately make a better prog uh, product and make yourself a better programmer uh, by letting go uh, uh, of the ego and letting some of that, uh, letting some of that uh, code go away. Uh, now, obviously, the danger uh, that you've had, and certainly I've had, is that you make something that's called a prototype, you hand it to your boss, and he's like, that looks so great, we should just put it into production and give it to customers. Uh, which leads to the very unfortunate scenario of you trying to prop up something while the car is still moving. Uh, obviously, uh, production is something that you should <laughs> avoid uh, uh, as much as possible. Uh, but if you think about the times in your career where that's actually happened versus the times where it hasn't, I think you might agree that uh, uh, um, uh, if you prototype more frequently, uh, get in a better habit of it, uh, this kind of event uh, can be avoided uh, with a little bit of care. So uh, with that said, why Django? Why is Django good for rapid prototyping, and I'm going to go ahead and make a bold claim. I'm going to say that Django is the best web framework for rapid prototyping. Uh, now, in my role at Twilio, I have to touch a number of different stacks. Uh, I have to help uh, developers with a number of different problems, some of which I'm familiar with, some of which I am not. Uh, and when it comes to uh, 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 the hackathon scenario, I encounter a lot of people, uh, particularly in the Python community, using a whole bunch of different web frameworks, right? Like when you're just trying to get something out the door and build something in 24 hours, you naturally say, well, maybe Flask is a better tool for the job, or maybe Bottle is, is a better tool for the job. Something that has a little less batteries included, uh, but uh, quite a bit more uh, uh, speed uh, to implementation. And, and I would argue that Django is actually superior to the options that are available to us as Pythonistas, uh, and indeed uh, available to us as web programmers uh, because of a couple key reasons. Uh, the first one is that Django was actually built for this. So the pedigree of Django being built in a newsroom makes it uniquely suited 
for rapid prototyping, right? The tagline on the website is uh, a web framework for perfectionists with deadlines, right? The ultimate deadline is getting something done uh, in 24 hours in, in time to demo, right? This entire web framework was built with that in mind. It was built for folks uh, who had to deal with uh, uh, editors that had absolutely no clue uh, how to implement what they wanted. They just know that they wanted it and they wanted it yesterday. Uh, and I think that pedigree still shines through, uh, uh, even into uh, the builds of Django 1.6. You still see uh, this pedigree at play. Second, it's flexible, right? And, and that kind of comes from that pedigree as well, right? Uh, you know, uh, everybody uh, uh, in the web sphere is uh, uh, talking about the different variants of the uh, model view whatever uh, 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 design paradigm. The thing that I find is super helpful with Django is when I'm working particularly with teams of folks who may not be familiar with Python, may not be familiar with Django, it's flexible enough that I can give them what they need in order to be productive while still uh, 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 keeping something that I can be proud of later. Uh, and this, this flexibility of the framework is, is super key. Uh, and then finally, it's you. The greatest strength of Django, make no mistake, is the community that supports it, right? Now, when, when you're taking a look at, at a rapid prototype, when you're trying to get something finished uh, in a quick period of time, uh, the uh, code that you're actually writing matters less than the answers that you're able to get. And those answers come in the form of Stack Overflow answers. They come uh, in the form of tutorials. They come in the form of blog posts. They come in the form of excellent books like Two Scoops uh, of Django. Um, you know, this, having this stuff available to you is not something that you find in a number of other frameworks. And being able to just go uh, into the Django chat room on Freenode and get a quick question answered is one of the reasons why it's great. So bottom line. Uh, I participate in, uh, in a number of different hackathons, and I can say the projects uh, that I've uh, uh, engaged with Django have completed at a higher percentage than the ones that haven't. So for me, uh, that's why Django continues to be uh, my top pick. So with all that said, so into the sermon, let's actually get to some hot Django action and talk about uh, some of the uh, bits that I feel make Django uniquely suited for rapid prototyping and some things that Django affords you uh, in order to uh, get that rapid prototyping done. Now, obviously, uh, the first step is that you got to get your uh, development environment set up. Uh, and I'll go ahead and refer to uh, Danny and Audrey's book uh, specifically here. Uh, if you haven't picked it up yet, they actually have some copies uh, that they'll be uh, uh, selling at lunch. Uh, chapters two and three are super, super perfect for this uh, with some best practices on setting up uh, your Django environment. Um, and because they are super, super nice people, they've actually made these tenants available in a repo that you can clone, uh, the link for which uh, you can find in the notes uh, for, uh, for my talk. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, really, really good features here, uh, a lot of breakdown of concerns, uh, separation of uh, requirements files for uh, each individual environment, uh, a, a lot of really good practices for Django 1.5 uh, that were built up over uh, uh, years of use. Uh, probably the only thing I would add uh, to the project as a whole is a, a proc file and a make file. Uh, Foreman uh, is an excellent tool uh, that a lot of folks have already installed in the machine. So if you're working on a diverse team at a hackathon, it kind of behooves you to uh, have the uh, execution of the app uh, wrapped up in a proc file so that it is easily launched. Uh, and then the make file becomes uh, super important, particularly when you're dealing with static files or you want to launch testing. Just makes a very, very simple shortcut that is uh, cross-platform that a lot of folks uh, can use. Now, on the complete other end of the spectrum, uh, the Two Scoops project uh, is super lightweight, uh, easy to understand, easy to grok. Uh, if you're looking for something that it has uh, quite a bit more batteries included and really optimizes for security, uh, there is a project uh, out by Mozilla uh, called Play-Doh, uh, which you can use as well. Now, Play-Doh comes with uh, a lot of distinct advantages, uh, and most of them are related to security. Uh, it has, uh, you know, uh, a lot of intense stuff, you know, SHA, uh, um, SHA-512 uh, hashing uh, for the passwords uh, built in, uh, much better salting. Uh, cookies are secure by default. Uh, it also uh, comes with uh, uh, the built-in sessions management uh, replaced with Django uh, sessions CSRF. Um, and uh, oh, it also comes with Bleach, uh, which is really good for uh, HTML uh, sanitation uh, or any uh, end user uh, input sanitation as well. 
Uh, obviously, uh, it does come with some problems. However, uh, the, uh, um, the project itself is actually based on uh, Django 1.3. Uh, it replaces Django templating with Jinja templates. Uh, so if you go this route, you definitely have to buy in all the way. Uh, but uh, in terms of the spectrum, those are kind of what you have to work with, something that uh, has a whole bunch of stuff included, uh, particularly security features, and one that's simple uh, and easy to use uh, right away. Uh, oh, those were the cons. I was making a joke about sneakers there, which is great. Uh, static files. Uh, this is another uh, big thing that uh, a lot of uh, folks who are trying to rapidly prototype on Django uh, struggle with early on. Uh, there are a lot of reusable apps that are out there for uh, uh, managing uh, your static files. Uh, honestly, I go to Django Contrib static files. Uh, it's really, really fantastic and just seems to get better with every single release. Uh, the big thing uh, that a lot of folks don't realize uh, that makes it super flexible for uh, rapid prototyping are the same defaults that static files comes with uh, when you include it in your project. So the file system finder and the app directories finder will look for static files, will look for your JavaScript, will look for your CSS inside application folders and inside the project folder as long as the uh, directory is called static. This is super helpful in a couple different ways. So if you're working with a team uh, that is uh, new to Django, keeping everything in one directory, particularly if they're big JavaScripters and they love building uh, single page applications, is super super, super useful than breaking it out by application for those particular type of developers. However, if you're working on a team that intends to reuse this code in other applications or does have some discipline around creating Django reusable apps, having them broken out also uh, by application makes a big difference. And then for deployment, static files makes it super easy. All you have to do is manage uh, manage.py, uh, collect static, and it'll uh, take everything, uh, copy it, and put it in one place. And there are also extensions that you can use uh, to do the minification uh, and uh, uh, code collation uh, of all those files uh, to make the uh, download as small as possible. There are also storage backends for S3 and, uh, and other bits, but uh, you don't need to worry about that uh, at the uh, prototyping stage. Uh, and a tool that's really great to work with static files uh, is a uh, uh, application that's really built for uh, HTML5 developers called Brunch, which I really like. A lot of folks like using uh, Yeoman and Grunt or uh, a couple other uh, uh, projects that are out there uh, in order to watch their files, uh, uh, particularly if they're developing CoffeeScript, compile everything into JS so that when you hit reload in your browser, you see it again. Uh, I'm not a JavaScripter of the first rank by any stretch of the imagination. I tried a whole bunch of different ones of these, and the one that I found worked best with Django uh, was called Brunch. I don't really have any technical details on why that's the case. Uh, I just found it super easy to set up. Uh, the, the configuration files are like 25 lines versus like the 500 line grunt files I was working with. Plus, uh, the thing I really like about Brunch is that it comes uh, with a, uh, a large community that has a set of skeletons that you can use for individual projects. So if you want to use Ember with Django, or you want to use Angular with Django, or you want to use Backbone with Django, there is a skeleton that will create a same project structure for you and watch those files uh, automatically, uh, which is something uh, that I found a little more difficult to find uh, in the grunt community. Uh, deployment. So you have that rapid prototype. You're all getting it running on your laptops. You also need to put it on some sort of central server so that you can show the world uh, the majesty of your prototype. Uh, and there are a couple options. Um, obviously, this is not a commercial plug. This is uh, just a heads up. Uh, if you weren't uh, already aware, uh, Heroku is now available uh, in Europe. They are now Safe Harbor certified. So you can uh, uh, actually deploy your apps uh, in Europe uh, with some reasonable uh, uh, response times uh, that you weren't getting before. Uh, when it comes to rapid prototyping, uh, I, I'm really hard pressed to find anything that's easier and cheaper uh, than Heroku. Obviously, uh, given you know, depending on your application, it may not be something that you can use. Maybe you need WebSocket support, or you know, maybe uh, uh, you don't want to pay for a Redis to go, and you're going to have a lot of stuff uh, in RAM. That's totally fine, uh, but uh, when you're coming to deployment, one of the things I would recommend that you do is really take a look at doing some configuration management. Uh, it's a skill that uh, developers uh, uh, tend to kind of gloss over. It does take some time and some investment. You're going to spend some Saturday afternoons banging your head against the wall, but there's some great, great chef recipes out there for uh, installing Django on fresh in EC2 instances of uh, Ubuntu Precise, uh, uh, one of which uh, is, uh, the, my favorite one is uh, Manuel Franco's, uh, comes uh, with uh, Nginx, uh, G Unicorn, 
whole bunch of stuff that you need to uh, run the stack automatically. A link for that is also in my notes. Uh, if you're kind of more of a pure Pythonista uh, and you'd prefer to use Salt uh, instead, there's actually some really good stuff uh, for this as well. Uh, Barry Morrison actually put up his Salt states for a very, very large stack, uh, which includes Celery. Uh, his uh, container, I think, is Mod Whiskey, uh, and a couple of uh, a couple other bits. Haven't used that myself, but it is available uh, if you so choose. And uh, just to kind of finally end the sermon, I really can't highlight enough for rapid prototyping how valuable the skill of configuration management is. Uh, whether you use Chef, whether you use Puppet, whether you use Salt, or any of the other configuration management tools that are out there, uh, I highly recommend it as a skill for you to pick up. Being able to quickly spin up new development environments, new production environments, is going to be extremely useful uh, as you uh, continue to uh, rapidly prototype. So, uh, so end of the sermon. Eat your vegetables. So let's talk about uh, some of the reusable apps uh, I find super useful uh, in uh, uh, the production of rapid prototypes using Django. Uh, and one of the first things I do uh, in any hackathon project I have or any rapid prototype I have is build a RESTful uh, API. So there are a couple of reasons why this is important. Uh, the first one is it just makes it easier for the other members of your team that are working on different stacks to interact with your uh, database models, right? So just uh, 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 taking a RESTful API, exposing that to your uh, uh, rest of your teammates ensures that they can use the tools that you want. You can make sure that all the important code is in Django and everybody can be happy, right? Uh, there are a couple ways of doing this uh, uh, with Django. Uh, the one that um, uh, I'm uh, the biggest fan of uh, for rapid prototyping is TastyPy. Uh, obviously, uh, there are a lot of different uh, uh, frameworks that are out there. Uh, all of them have kind of their pros and cons. Uh, for TastyPy, I think, you know, it's the absolute fastest path from defining a model in models.py and actually have a working uh, RESTful endpoint that people can use and actually perform CRUD operations on. Uh, it's well tested. Uh, it's pretty easy to control. To. Uh, it's uh, Hadios by default. Uh, and in addition uh, to all that, um, uh, if you didn't already know, uh, Daniel Lindsley uh, is a pretty nice guy, which is uh, another good pro. Obviously, there's some uh, uh, cons with the project, many of which uh, I've heard a lot of folks at, at the conference uh, already talk about. Uh, it's super tightly coupled, uh, meaning that uh, these are not Django views that you're going to be working with. Uh, a lot of the code for uh, data hydration, uh, dehydration, uh, is all uh, bound together. You're not working with something as easy as uh, Django views. So if that flexibility is important to you, there is actually another great option, uh, which is uh, the Django REST framework. Uh, so there are a couple uh, good advantages here. It does take a little bit more time to set up than TastyPy, but when you do, you're actually working with Django views, which gives you a whole bunch more flexibility. Uh, in addition to that, when you're working with other teammates, uh, uh, Django REST framework makes every endpoint available as a web browsable endpoint. So if you go to an endpoint in your browser, you will get a form that will allow you uh, to interact with that uh, uh, endpoint and see some of the critical data about this. Uh, this is super, super useful uh, when you're working with a team of novices in particular uh, at a hackathon. A uh, really, really easy way uh, to quickly install an app, get a configuration, point it to your models, and uh, present them uh, with some uh, good information. Uh, and another pro uh, of the framework is uh, Tom Christie, who's around here, is also a very nice guy. So you should talk to him. It's awesome. Next up is social auth. So this one is super, super fun uh, for the Django community because uh, it is, uh, it's kind of like uh, Green Day and Bush Records for anyone who grew up in uh, the United States during the 90s. It seems that everyone has their own copy of <laughs> a social authentication plugin for Django. I mean, there's a whole bunch. Uh, it's a total rat's nest when you look at it uh, for the first time. You have Django social login, Django social profile, Django social registration, Django connect, Django les social, Django social auth without a hyphen, Django social auth with a hyphen. There are a lot of choices, and it's pretty easy to get confused uh, if you're looking at it for the first time. Now, I have already gone through the painful of experience of working with most of these already, and I could say there are two that I can recommend for your rapid prototype uh, to uh, easily uh, get some social auth uh, up and running. 
Uh, the, the biggest one and the most popular one certainly is Django social auth. Uh, this is what uh, most of the way that the community has uh, put itself towards now and I think a lot of that has to do with the careful decision to uh, develop a plug-in architecture early uh, in this reusable app which makes uh, adding new authentication endpoints super, super easy to do. Uh, Django social auth has more uh, authentication backends than nearly any other uh, solution that's out there. Uh, the code's pretty clean, uh, easy to work with. Um, the, the setup does take uh, a little bit more time uh, than uh, some other options that are out there. But if you need to uh, uh, connect, uh, particularly a custom user model, to a number of different services, Django Social Auth uh, is definitely the way to go. Uh, another option, if you're abs absolutely focused on speed, is Django All Auth. Um, so uh, comparing the two in a speed test in terms of development time, meaning uh, getting uh, 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 pip install uh, the reusable app and actually getting authentication working on a public web endpoint. I've had more success with uh, Django All Auth uh, than I had Django Social Auth. Uh, it also supports custom user models, so you have that available as well. Uh, uh, really, uh, it's just a question of the implementation uh, that the uh, uh, authors of each plugin or each uh, reusable app have chosen uh, in order to make uh, the difference uh, uh, in implementation time. A little less flexible, a little less support for uh, services that are out there, but if you absolutely positively need to authenticate with Facebook right now, I would recommend Django all off. Uh, I was going to talk about South, uh, but Andrew already gave a great talk about it yesterday, and Christoph mentioned it uh, during the, uh, his Postgres talk. So uh, being that I am the person uh, right before lunch, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, not talk about South, except to say that it's super important and super great. Uh, if you did miss the first day, uh, you missed some really great talks, so that's kind of a bummer. Celery. So uh, this, uh, a lot of folks uh, say, doesn't have to do with Django. But uh, honestly, out of all the tools that I have in my fanny pack when I walk into a uh, hackathon, uh, being really salty with Celery uh, makes a huge difference. You'd be really surprised in your rapid prototypes how often you need a fully functional generic task queue. Uh, and so having this in your tool belt is kind of an unfair advantage. It's an unfair advantage not just for yourself uh, and your hackathon team, but it's also an unfair advantage for Python and Django as a whole, right? So if you look at a lot of the other frameworks that are out there, like Steve Klabnik uh, a couple months ago just uh, started a campaign to uh, improve Rask uh, to give Rails developers the same sort of functionality that we're afforded uh, through Celery. Uh, it's something that is uh, unique uh, to Python, uh, uh, unique to Django, and something that you should take advantage of uh, because it's super, super unfair. Now, I think the reason why a lot of people don't uh, uh, work with uh, uh, Celery uh, frequently is that the setup is a bit of a daunting challenge. Like, there's a lot of moving parts. You've got to set up a message bus. Uh, it, it can get uh, uh, super complex. But a Django chip that I can set, uh, share with you is if you install Django Celery, uh, it can actually cheat for you. It can uh, 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 use the uh, Django database uh, as the message bus uh, to avoid the additional uh, deployment complexity of installing uh, RabbitMQ. So if you install Django Celery, you can actually just use your database. Obviously, that's not something you want to do in production, kids. But it'll get your rapid prototype up and running uh, quickly. Uh, to continue preaching on the configura uh, configuration management piece, uh, again, uh, the chef recipes and cookbooks that are around for Django Celery stacks are super, super small, are super, super strong. Uh, go ahead and check them out. It'll save you a lot of time uh, and a lot of effort. Finally, I was going to talk a bit uh, about testing. So testing is something that's near and dear uh, to my heart in my production code, but it's something that I would argue you need to look at uh, in your rapid prototypes as well. Now, a lot of people are saying, like, Rob, you only have 25 hours in a hackathon. What are you doing testing? And why are you talking to me with crab hands? And to that, I say, uh, I don't know. And two, um, why not? So turning the question uh, back over to you, I'd really ask why you wouldn't want to test when time is of the essence. When you're building a rapid prototype, when you're trying to get under the gun for a hackathon in particular, you're not killed by the mistakes you make. You're killed by the mistakes you make twice. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not suggesting that TDD is something that you have to do at every single hackathon. I'm saying there's a balance. Just making sure your views return 200 OK 
puts you at a significant advantage over other folks in the hackathon because you will know if some sort of knuckleheaded error caused a problem before you push that code up uh, for your demo. Uh, including testing uh, in your app is uh, super, super crucial and super, super easy uh, with Django. I mean, uh, uh, everybody loves to talk about Nose, uh, and it is a really great testing framework, but the combination of Nose and uh, the Django uh, test client allows you to do a whole lot of stuff. Uh, at the unit test level to make sure that the uh, code that you're producing is strong. And I'm not sure why uh, you wouldn't uh, avail yourself of that. In addition to that, uh, there is a really strong uh, client uh, 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 JavaScript client MVC uh, called AngularJS that actually ships uh, with a product that I think you should use as well, even if you don't use uh, Angular. So uh, one of the bits uh, for Angular that uh, I find really strong, uh, particularly as a novice JavaScripter, uh, is its emphasis on testability. So the uh, framework itself ships with the dependency injector that makes uh, testing your uh, controllers uh, inside your client-side JavaScript app super, super simple to do. You just define a Jasmine behavior, uh, and it can test uh, the stuff for you. Now, with this uh, testing framework, Testacular, it also comes with an end-to-end -end testing framework that's a lot easier to configure than Selenium, and something that you can actually do when you're developing a rapid prototype. So this very simple uh, node module, which you can ha have execute uh, along with Brunch or along with Grunt, will detect any changes that uh, occur in your static files and go ahead and run the test for you, front to back, in an actual browser, in multiple browsers, if you so choose, super, super super fast. Uh, so definitely check out Angular. Uh, check out Testacular. So guys, I want to thank you very much uh, for your patience, but we're coming up on some conclusions, and then we'll uh, take some questions uh, and break for lunch. Django and rapid prototyping. Let us learn from Rear Admiral David Farragut from the American Civil War. Uh, when faced with a difficult problem, sometimes the best thing to do is go full speed ahead. Uh, Django is absolutely uh, the best tool uh, in order for do that, and the reason why it's the best tool is because of all of you. Guys, thank you very much for having me in Poland. Thank you very much for having me at DjangoCon. Really appreciate it. <laughs>